Here we go. Welcome to the Level Up Your Gym podcast. I am Joe Hashi, your host, and today I am joined by Joe Ken. Absolute pleasure to have Joe on the show. I'm going to give you a little bit background of Joe and how we happened to meet, but Joe's got 31 years of experience as a strength a performance specialist and strength and conditioning coach. He's got 19 years of college experience. That's where I first saw Joe when he was making combine prep DVDs, probably VHS. With, uh, was was it that... DVD with Mark? I think it was DVD by then. I don't think it was VHS. I think, it was, I think we were in the DVD age. I must have got the first edition of the DVD. Yeah. Uh, I think it was you and Martin out at maybe yep. Arizona State. Is that where it was shot at? Yep, for sure. And we picked up a lot of combine prep team from the spider the spider technique on the five ten five, and then your bench that was hit. The, that was the cheat technique, and then they ruled that <laughs> they ruled that that was like a one or two year deal. Oh, we were Adam, smoking people Adam, with that. Adam Archuleta, Archuleta did it, and no one waved him waved him wrong. Like they they credited it, and everybody went to it. And Martin really he fine tuned it because at the beginning, you know, the five ten five. It's supposed to show lateral speed and agility, but it's also supposed to show how well you can sink your hips. And that's why they never wanted you to touch the inside hand. And then when they let it for that two or three years, that was some of the fastest five, 10, five times in the history of the combine. Well, we used it. We used it on a high school level for all the athletes we were training. And it was long and they, no one really picked up on any of that stuff. So for like a decade, kids were smoking it with that technique. Yeah. <laughs> and that was where I first came across your material and I followed it ever since. But now, since then, you've had nine years uh, experience the NFL strength and conditioning. Now you're back in the private sector with dynamic fitness and strength. Uh, you had the NFL head, head strength coach experience. Was that all with the Carolina Panthers, Joe? Yeah, for the full uh, full tenure, nine years with the Panthers. So, it, like anything else, hard hard job to get. You don't want them to. You don't want to leave them. And the fact that I was able to do nine years in the NFL is uh, pretty astonishing. A uh, great goal to accomplish for sure. And I got to be at the job I always wanted. That was my dream job. So, it worked out well for me. So we have an absolute world of experience and joe and i as much as we crap talk each other i only met once in person and that was at the <laughs> arnold like five years ago yeah. uh you happened to be in the crowd and we got to text each other and we met up watched uh your buddy brian shaw compete yep. and you introduced and me to him starts at the today end. yep he starts today you introduced me to him five. at the end and uh you know i'm six five i was thinking i was pretty big i am not <laughs> i am not pretty big his hand just like yeah. my hand was gone when I shook his hand well I know I'm up, I'm right at right under six two six one and three quarters so I can lie and say I'm six two or six three but he's all of six eight and he's all of 425 plus right now yeah and this is his I mean again he's trained hard uh, and you know you only can compete against who you compete I'll be interested to see how how this thing goes down for him because it's almost set up for him to win a lot of the guys aren't in it. A couple of guys who were the favorites got hurt, and he's been as healthy as he was. I think regardless, the way he was training leading up to May, because I had done some work with him on some agility and mobility stuff, if it would have been in May, I think it would have been regardless of who was in it, he was ready to go for it. But now, I'll be – like I said, man, I'm pulling for him because if you follow the, the world of strong man – he wins five. He's in a he's in a unique category. He ties Pujanowski, and he's getting towards the. You hate to say it, but in in that deal, he's getting closer to the end than he is the beginning. He's on the other side of halftime, and the battles he had with Zavikis for all those years. It'll be hard. It'll be hard for him when it comes to just the amount of wins. A lot of people are always going to side with Zavikis because he won all those Ifser titles and. If he would have been competing in World's Strongest Man instead of if so, who knows how many he would have won. But the the head to head battles that him and Brian had were I don't think there were any two better competitors at that point in time in Strong Man that were that legit. So regardless, I think Taz is always going to be top three because he got robbed. Uh, he'll probably in my world it's going to be uh, Brian and Zavikis fighting for who's number one. And Kaz number three, because they cheated Kaz. He might still be winning. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do love watching the shows. I love the competitiveness of the shows. When I was younger, it was Marius just running away with things. And every year you knew who was competing for second. But uh, now you get – it's so competitive to see Brian do it. Well, and, the, and then the size and the change. Remember when Pujanowski won, what was he, no more than 255? You know, Yoko Ahola, even uh, Magnus for Magus, Magnuson. But, again, it's funny if you watch – how the implements have increased in, sh in the loads. Because remember, back in those days, the traditional farmer's walk was only 220 a hand. It was, a, it was based off a 200 kilogram total. So you had 220 in a hand, and that was standard. And now, hell, you're doing five or 600 in a hand on some, for like 15 or 20 feet, depending on what meat you're in. I mean, it's, it's gotten outrageous. And that's why those guys now are, you know, 350, 400 pounds is the norm. Yeah, and it, it is funny to think of a world where 255 is, like, undersized. You're like, dang, that guy's small, yeah, 255. That's small. Yeah, that, that's not even that's undersized. Small. That's small. Like, 300-pound <laughs> strongman now, that's small. Like, you see Rob Kearney show up, and Rob was actually a intern trainer for us in 2012 with the Panthers, and I remember him talking about being a strongman, and now here he is, one of the best in the world, and he's competing, and he's not a super overly big man, and – He's out there competing with the best of them. So Joe has a world of experience and knowledge from, from athletics to strongman to you know, working with a lot of people. And that's why I invited Joe on the Level Up Your Gym podcast. And I wanted him to come on sh to share today from his 30 plus years of experience, uh, his three big ideas for gym owners that can help you out, whether we're talking building your community to, to lengthen the, the, the stay of your members to help keep your company growing to have a good culture that attracts people like he's talking about like Rob attract quality staff, but I've got Joe on today and I'm going to let him go and see what he gives us today. Uh, so when I think about the private sector, the first thing I want to give out is a big uh, kudos and much respect to all of you who have invested your own finances and putting your name on a storefront. My time in the private sector has been slightly different. When I, when I was in the private sector in 2009, I looked to buy a storefront. I was going to go in and purchase, I was actually gonna buy a, one of the top uh, uh, franchises facility, but I didn't need the franchise's name. I was going to bank on my name. I just needed a facility and a book of business. As I went through that process and looking at the marketing and looking at the books, looking at the uh, sub, uh, sub uh, contractors, so to speak, and trying to get other people in to help with the leasing. And I, I felt it was actually better for me to look at subletting out of somebody's building. One, because one, because in the market that I was moving to, yeah, everybody at that point in time, I was just finishing a 19-year run as a college strength and conditioning coach. And, and, and for, you know, again, my reputation on that level was very, very high. But nobody really knows me in the private sector. And now I'm moving out of the state where I coached. So I have no real name recognition going in. Fortunately for me, I played college football with Ricky Prohl, who was a 17-year NFL vet. He, he, he moved back to the area. We played college ball, and he opened up a huge performance park called Prolific Park in Greensboro, North Carolina. And after I had done my due diligence and really decided that buying a facility was not conducive to what I was hoping to accomplish, and here's why, and I'm sure some of you have seen this in your own research. What it, what are you really buying sometimes when you're looking to buy someone's gym? And what I found out with this particular gym, and again, remember I said, this was one of the high level uh, models of performance training franchises. Well, you're doing the research and they're trying to show you your book of business. They're trying to show you your finances. They're asked, here's their asking price. And really, if they don't own the building, what are you buying? What yeah, I found out was I'm buying a book of business because I'm paying him whatever or her a certain amount of price that he wants to sell their business for. But yet I still got a lease on a building that I don't own. And I'm hoping the people who are subletting are going to stay on when that lease is up. So what I realized was 
it's almost like I'm paying double for this business because I still got to pay this guy a monthly cut. And then I got to pay a lease on a building I don't own. So I was like, you know what? I'm, this doesn't make sense to me. And I didn't have the, the finances to buy a building because what we found out is uh, if you watched Founder, the, the story of McDonald's, and if you study enough of what Planet Fitness does, they're in the realty business. <laughs> they, they're realtors. And they sell franchises, but the truth is, from what I've heard with the Planet Fitness is, when you see a Planet Fitness in the strip mall, they own the whole strip mall. And every other business that's in there is paying Planet Fitness's lease for their part of it. So that's why they get away with what they get away. And I'm not 100% sure, but I've heard enough and I've researched enough to think I'm pretty close to correct. They're in the real estate business. So for me, it was better off to be a sublet hopefully build a book of business. And then if it grew, one, figure out a way to make myself more viable within Ricky's Park, or do you venture out and now look for your own storefront? Because that, as we all know, and I'm sure you could say this, talk to this on too, Joe, in the end, the ultimate goal for anybody who's going into business for themselves really is to pull up to the parking lot and see your name on the top of the storefront. I think there's a lot of value in there. There's a lot of self-satisfaction in that. There, there's a lot of, you know, hard-earned work that shows that you are winning. Like I always tell people, I don't care what your business is. If you are a self-made businessman and you have your name on the storefront and you are sustainable and things are going well, I have the utmost respect for you because I did it as a subletty watching how that works. It's extremely tough. I'm not, as a subletter, I'm not worried about if I left the lights on when I leave. You as the owner, you're driving back. Oh, damn. I got a 60,000 square foot facility. I might have left the lights on. I can't have them on for eight hours all night. Where me, and again, I don't mean that in a bad way, but you're just thinking that way. So for all of you who own your own facilities, I have much kudos for you. Well, yeah, let me, let me share in on that because we just had a, a woman on the podcast. It's actually not published as of this recording, so you wouldn't have seen it named Liberty Harper, who uh, started a franchise model called Liberty Fitness out in the Midwest. She grew it to 60 locations and sold it. She got involved in another franchise, and they switched to a licensee. So there's like a lot of different things you could do. You could do franchise. You could do li franchise like the business system. License is like just their name up on the building. You can start small. Like I did, I started in my garage until I got 20 clients. Then I moved to behind a baseball facility for cheap till I got 100 clients. Then I moved next door to the storefront where I could afford putting the name on the business because that afforded me the, the time to build a scalable marketing strategy. So if you're in a position, you're listening to this and you already have your name on the building and you're struggling, what you need to do is invest in that book of business that Joe's talking about. I would not have been able to start a storefront and continue to exist today from A to now because that book of business, business and scalable marketing is an education plan. And that's the difference when I've worked and consulted for F45s or Orange Theories, they have a grand opening plan, they have a timeline, they have it all strategically developed, like in your first 90 days, you need to hit these numbers. If you just go through your name on a business because you like fitness, and you start a company, you're going to be starting behind the eight ball and it's going to be a struggle. So if you're in that situation now, you got to get a heck of a lot better at marketing and study those franchises. There, there's things to learn from everyone. The way they do their grand opening plans is amazing. And we've actually been through it with my company. We invested in someone that opens uh, Orange Theories and Title Boxing Clubs and went through the process with them. And we went to um, a gentleman who manages a bunch of Planet Fitnesses and learned how they do their walk around model. And you might think, well, Planet Fitness is kind of a fluffy place. Well, there's a reason why they're growing and it's because they do a lot right. And if you can pick up bits and pieces and connect them to your business, develop a marketing plan, then you can get your name and lights on the big marquee like Joe Ken's talking about. Well, it's funny you brought up Planet Fitness and we've talked about it. You know, they, have an, they have an interesting model. Let's face it. They don't want guys like us in their gym. Right. They, don't. they know their but, demographic. But here's the funny thing. My buddy just sent me this. You know, when COVID, when COVID hit, certain markets went down in fitness and certain went up. One that went up crazy was Peloton. Yep. Everybody yeah. joined the Peloton family. But now as things start to resurface, my buddy just sent me this. It's funny we're talking about it. That Peloton has gone down. Their, their percentages of improvement have gone down, but it's still up like 200 and something percent from the beginning of the year. 
But then they said like Planet Fitness is up 16 and a half percent from a gym where all these other gyms are closing. And remember, again, Planet Fitness is a different model. How's Planet Fitness up 16 and a half percent, but yet Gold's Gym and 24 Hour Fitness are going, are, are filing for bankruptcy? More name recognition than ever. Gold's Gym is filing for bankruptcy. And it shows you study models of people who are successful. You can laugh all you want about lunk alarms and this and that, but they've got, they're up 16 and a half percent in a business that was demolished by the closings of, of allegedly non-essential businesses. So again, the business plan is huge. I learned, I learned that my, luckily for my wife had a business background, so she was understood. We invested several thousand dollars in a business plan when we moved back to North Carolina to figure out how viable uh, performance training would be. And remember, performance training in itself is a unique scope of the private sector uh, longevity plan. I didn't want to do adult fitness 10 years ago. I, I just didn't. So I was looking for other areas of revenue streams that I could just concentrate on, on high school athletes, professional athletes, youth athletes, and so forth. But again, I was able to build that way because I didn't own a building and my rent was in my percentages were very, very feasible for me to make as I continued to in increase my clientele list. The, the other differences I want you guys to remember too is that I've learned this by watching the evolution of Athletes Performance Institute, which is now Exos. If you, there's a big difference to me between general pop personal trainers and private sector performance coaches. I think there's a, if there's a different there's a different level of experience. There's a different level of knowledge. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, but I know training general pop, there's a lot of things that you have to know that you don't really need to know as a sports performance coach for, for athletes and vice versa. So I think it's really two different genres of people now. You're not a personal trainer if you train athletes. You're a private sector coach. Coach, coach and trainer, those – Although there's a lot of similarities, it's based off the population that you train. You've got to decipher that. I know, I know it's hard to break people out of that. Everybody considers people in the private sector, my trainer, my trainer, my trainer. But really, you're a coach. And that's something I think that you got to look at when you're building out your plans, too. How do you want to be recognized when you're dealing with a certain clientele? Uh, and I, and you may go back and forth. If you coach general pop in the morning, then you may be training people. But now when you've got your sports performance, high school, Olympic sports in there, you are coaching them. It's a, it's a different, and you want them to, I'm big into that stuff. So I want those people to address me as coach when they're talking about what we're doing. Well, my coach says this because it helps give a little bit, not, I don't want to call it credibility. It just separates the differences of two different ways of physical fitness training, if that makes sense. These are little things that I talked about to myself as I was going into the plan. Now, 10 years later, in the way I train as a 50 plus year old athlete, and some of the things I've learned for myself, there, I, would, I would definitely lead some master's age, general population movement classes because I've built out the way I train. Like for example, the first 30 minutes of the way I train, I can turn into an adult fitness class and just have them come in for 30 to 40 minutes a day. Just do the pre-activity prep preparation formula of my programming. And I, I would, I know I would be successful with 40 plus year old adults. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of things to unpack in there before I let you go on the third one. So number one, you have to know your numbers. Number two, Joe was just talking about, you have to identify what business you're in. You have to have clarity on that up front. And you can't be everything to everyone. We've gone through the, the case where we're like, All right, we'll put up job openings and we'll get one-on-one -on -one trainers from commercial gyms. We'll get sports performance coaches and we'll sit down and interview them. And they are very different individuals. And there's not a, a judgment call on which one would be better or worse for you, but you need to understand they are different. You just don't hire someone that says, hey, I, I train people. 
okay, is that the right fit for you and your company? You need to start defining that before you select your coaches. And the last thing that Joe's going to start to get on, and I want to uh, ask more questions on it, he said that he prefers that his clients refer to him as coach, and he creates that atmosphere. Joe, do you have any more tips on creating that, that atmosphere of a productive exercise session? Or I don't want to say group because they're really kind of individualized. But yes, I mean, again, that comes back to like – I mean, uh, there's a lot of terms that get overblown, right? But now we're talking about like culture, right? Like people like, you know, they yes. get into their little groups. That's my tribe, right? You know, and these, these terms. I, I think the first thing you have to do when you're looking at certain things is who are you? Like, what are you? Like, what is your deal? Like, I'm a coach. I don't know anything about but coaching athletes. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've learned a lot more about coaching myself. So I really think I could be successful coaching general population. But the questions are like, what, what do you value and what are you going to hold as key metrics to how you're going to, I like, I mean, again, we're selling a product in the private sector. One is the tough thing is when you're dealing with what we deal with athletes is, are you willing to stick to what you believe in, in a, I got to get my kid here now philosophy when you're interviewing parents and coaches? I was starting a business and turned down a lot of potential clients because their perception of what performance training looks like is what we see a lot of the bells and whistles, all the gimmicks and nothing against those gimmicks if they're used correctly. But a lot of these young inexperienced coaches sell their program on gimmicks with no deferential to programming. I always say like some of these general speed and agility type programs they're eight week programs you pay for and then your kid gets done with eight weeks you sign him up for another eight weeks and he repeats the eight week course where with coaching you go through eight weeks and you sign up for the next eight weeks you start at week nine because there's some type of progressing plan and this is what you have to ask yourself and you have to be willing to turn someone down which is hard Cause like in college and pro I'm going to get clients every day, regardless I'm on a salary in the private sector. You need as many numbers as you can coach on a daily basis to make your living. So it's hard to do that, but I think people will respect you and learn, Hey man, this is, you don't call the shots. And, yeah. And I think there's the two very important things in there and trained. I think we did the math over a hundred thousand adult sessions now. And I can say the same thing is true for adults that they need to see progression if they were going to stay with you. And that's why I've never really liked the write a whiteboard workout and I do it for a month. They do the same workouts. And if someone joins and they're on the same plan, you're not showing the progressions. You're not standing up any landmarks in their mind and their memory bank. If I've accomplished something like climb a mountain, take a picture at the top, you go over to the next mountain and those, those accomplishments are what they remember and they help keep long-term clients. And also what Joe's saying in a very um, politically correct way is you'll see a lot of people out there running around with like parachutes in the field for five weeks or whatever, um, blowing them all over the place. And again, they could be used correctly, but uh, then their parents come in and say, Hey, where's your agility ladders, where are your parachutes? And you identify and you, and you do analysis on their specific kid and they just don't have enough strength to put force into the ground to propel them forward and you prescribe some strength stuff that in the private sector you can number one you could say hey it's not a good fit number two we have a, a core value at our company called meet people where they're at you can say i understand where you see this stuff you see it on the ads it's flashy they can sell you some products but i think i can really help with developing some strength are you willing to give it eight weeks so you can see the difference between what this full program looks like and perhaps what the gimmicky stuff looks like. So you still kind of come in it with some empathy and understanding. They don't know if they should trust you or that, you know, Spark magazine they see, which again, it's fine, but they need to, um, you need to meet people where they're at and don't just uh, turn them off to you. You have to like give them a reason why and explain. And, that, and that's a hard part in the private sector because what happens is if you open up a performance group and let's just say you have a 16 person group and, and, your, and your coaching staff's limited. You may have to open up a brand new group that starts at week one. And, and then, even then, as you go through the evaluation, like I had what I call block zero, which is our beginning program. And in, in the private sector, that was for preteen, 
middle school athlete. So I coached 10 year olds, but I had a six ball player who had to go into that group because when I did my basic assessment, he wasn't prepared to go into my physical preparation for football class. And he was devastated. His dad was great about it. Like his dad understood. I mean, the guy couldn't touch his toes. I mean, just basic, couldn't hold a lunge. I can't ask you to do the things I'm going to ask you to do when, with these guys. These guys are coming from, you know, their high school programs and they're pretty good movers. And this is all the assessment stuff. And, and he wind up that his dad liked it so much. He wound up bringing like nine other kids from the high school over. And it was funny because all those kids were in my, my group and this poor kid had to come an hour earlier to do the block zero stuff. But, you know, after a month, I evaluated again. I said, man, I got You got to give me two more weeks. But by the time he was ready to go, I was confident. He had seen the improvements. And in that world, the parents saw the improvement. So again, it's hard. I, it's very hard. I don't, I don't know how I would progress this if I, if I go back into a full bloat group training. And, and let's remember this too, at the private sector, group, how you train a group, I don't care if it's, and I call, I'll consider a group three or more. So how you train a group from a programming standpoint is going to be different than if you're training somebody, a high level athlete or any athlete one-on-one. -on -one. You can do more, the, the less, the less amount of people you deal with in a group, the more you can do with them. That's why I have a, I have like a pet peeve of people who've lived in the private sector their whole lives when they make jabs at coaches that coach at the college level or even the pro level were like, well, if I was there, I'd be doing this. Or when I was there, I'd be doing that. No, you wouldn't because oh. I would be doing something different if I was in your world. You don't, you don't understand the rules that we have against us the time we have against us. I mean, if I, I can set up a private sector training with you, Joe, as long as I want, as long as you're willing to pay for the hours, right? If you're a high level athlete, those guys will pay. But when, when, you're in a, when you're in a group setting at the College of Pros and you're only allowed six to eight hours a week with them and they're only allowed in the, in the building four hours a day, you're at, you're at times beck and call. You're gonna, you're gonna write programs different than if time's not a factor. Yeah, and from playing college football, we had, you know, geez, probably 65, 70 people in the weight room at Colgate, a small school. And, uh, I mean, the head strength coach and two interns. And so you got to program differently for the people that, that are in the building. Yeah, so going back to the culture stuff, you just got to ask, like, what your values are. And that's how you evaluate the types of kids you want. I mean, I wanted hardworking kids that were chasing goals. Whatever that goal would be, again, and some of it's laughable, and I don't mean laughable like uh, I think it's a joke, like laughable like what some kids are asked to do. Uh, I had a great example that I'll tell you is I had a 10-year-old kid in my Block Zero class that him and his mom came when they first met me, and their biggest concern was he wasn't fast enough to make the travel team's, what is that called, minimum standards of running from – home plate to first or home plate to second. And he's like, I've got to do this in like seven point something seconds to make this travel team. I go, how old are you? And I'm like, who sets these? Like, what is this? Is it like 100% ridiculous. But yet this is why they wanted training because it meant so much to be on the 10 and under travel team. And I have to run this time. Uh, luckily for me, the training worked out and he made the time he came in with his mom and dad were cheered up his uh, mom and him were teared up. But like what I've learned is too, with the private sector, when I talk about what your values are, are, and again, I don't want to use the term sellout, but stick to who you are because who you are is the truth. If you try to be someone you're not, these kids can see through it. There's so much out there now, they can see what I would call a fraud. They'll figure it out at some point in time. When I, when I was in the private sector, again, I sublet it. There was multiple different people in there. Everybody had their ways of training. And, and I was doing, people saw what I was doing and didn't understand there's a lot to building speed. Uh, a lot of it has to do with relative body weight strength. So while everybody else is running through ladders, my kids are doing iso lunge holds and reverse lunge. 
And by the end of my time there, the, the people were calling me Miyagi because I was doing everything that was non-traditional that they thought was speed training. And all I was doing was building fundamentals. And when we actually started running, everybody's parents were like, oh my God, I didn't know. You know, we were, it was like ridiculous how satisfied they were with the results. And we never really did a speed drill or, or, or something speed related until I thought they were able to, we were able to lunge, reverse lunge 300 yards. It sounds outrageous, but that's how we were building relative strength. We had a grid program. We had a lunge progression program. We did basic, basic stuff, just teaching them. I mean, we did a lot of backwards running. I'm a big fan of backwards running. I think it helps uh, learn how to flex the knee and extend the hip. It's, it, most people think it's uh, kind of a falsity, but I don't think it has a big merit in hamstring strength and development. Uh, some people think that's like a, one of those, uh, what do you call that, voodoo, voodoo drills for hamstring work, but I, I've seen it work. I've seen it work in hamstring recovery. So that's another thing you got to ask yourself is how do you want, how do you want your people to, to uh, remember you by? And I, I wanted to be the guy who taught your basics. I didn't want anybody to be somebody who rushed you into something. As I learned over time, and a couple of my buddies have really emphasized this on me, if you're a private sector coach and you've got athletes coming from the local schools, how do you want to be recognized by that high school and that coaching staff? You don't want them to alienate you and you're the enemy. You want to be secondary support. And the one thing you can do is reach out to those coaches and build a relationship and let them know, look, I'm not here to steal your guys, especially as former athletes. You know, that's important to train on site with your, with the team. But like me and Joe talked about, there's a lot of things they can't get done in the time frames they have. I, I want to be that assistant, like the assistance to it. Like, again, most high school programs are going to do a tremendous amount of bilateral stuff. But unilateral and pseudo, and, pseudo, and pseudo single leg work and things like that are highly critical at regardless of what level of strength training you're in, they have to be introduced. So let me worry about that stuff. If they're going to come to me, I'll take care of all the ancillary stuff and you focus on the big stuff. And then if, I, if, I, if a guy I feel like I could help clean up some technique on the big stuff, then it's the technical. So this, these are the questions you have to ask when you're building yourself up and the types of things that your culture will be perceived and how people speak to you outside of the building. Because the one thing I learned is you can give out as many flyers as you want. You can give out as many Facebook ads as you want. You can go on Instagram and talk about how great your programs are and how cheap they are and what the cost per hour is. But you're going to get clients by what those kids say to their friends and what their parents say to their parents' friends. So at the end of the day, it always comes back to an open relationship. And if you're confident enough, is where do you allow the parents to be during these sessions? I know at the high, the highly franchised stuff, they keep them like in a little box. It's almost like they're in daycare while the kids are training. We had an, I had an open policy. You could get as close as you can get to me coaching your son or daughter without affecting the workout because one I wanted to hear I wanted them to hear what I was saying and I wanted them to see how well we could coach large groups because as you know a lot of this sells sometimes with these people and they merit to everything again I'm not trying to say right or wrong a lot of times when you hear one to six ratio coach the athlete one to eight one to four I'll be honest with you. A lot of times that's because that's what the coach is comfortable coaching. That's like their limit. When you've been in my setting, I've coached 50, 60 guys with some help on the floor. So for me to have a group of 16 high school football players, that's, that's easy schmeasy. I, I, co I can coach the hell out of that group. And a lot of parents were like, well, and then they watch and they're like, oh, man, he's right. I mean, I, was, I didn't even know where he was. He was coaching my kid. All I heard him was barking orders to all these kids. I didn't even know where he was standing. And we were in a double batting cage. So it wasn't like we had closed walls. You could see, you just, 
but that's coaching and you learn. And again, everybody's experiences give them benefits. My benefit was I'm coming from large group settings to small group settings. I'm going to win. Yeah. And to, to kind of land this airplane, cause I know I promised only a half minute of your time. I have three, three comments. Number one, my business and performance coach mind is both lighting up by what you're saying. And I hope the listeners are too. So if you want me to uh, send a pen and paper invite to get Joe back on the show for another one of these episodes with your questions, because he doesn't do electronics, I got to send him a postcard handwritten <laughs> via a uh, mail carrier to his Salisbury I Pony do, Express. I don't do calendar apps. <laughs> Ex- send me an email at joe at levelupyourgym.com and say, get Big House back on the show. Because out of respect for his time, oh shoot, I just dropped my notes. Out of respect for his time, I want to make sure we keep him to 30 minutes today. But there's a couple of things in there I want to highlight, then I'll give him the last word and where you can learn more from Joe from his stuff. The second, my second point was what Joe said about five minutes ago about identifying exactly what you want. That speaks very strong on the coaching side and the business marketing side. Those aren't two opposite ends of the spectrum. And part of the reason why I started Level Up Your Gym is to get people to understand that there can be excellent coaches that run great businesses. It's not like someone's got an interesting marketing idea and then just has their, they run companies their way and then strength coaches run their companies their way. But what Joe said that he was looking for hardworking kids that want to chase goals. I wrote that down. If you run an athlete training company, you send out an email to your parents, say, I'm looking for hardworking kids that want to chase goals. Are you interested? You're going to get a bunch of kids signing up because you're being clear on exactly what you're going to provide for them. For us in the adult sector, we're looking for busy adults who want to renew their energy and feel great. Are you interested? If you speak the same message and you know what you're looking for, you're going to be able to serve your community to a much higher level and be able to help people out. And I want to thank Joe for, for, I wrote that looking for hardworking kids lying down. So we do have our kids class. I'm going to send that out and make a thousand dollars easy off Joe's tips, but more important, be able to serve eight to 10 more kids because that's what people are looking for. Joe, I want to pass it over to you to the last words. Now I'll, I'll tell you this too, because it's funny you, cause you had brought up what you're looking for, what your goals would be for training the adults. Mine, mine is for, uh, I have, I would have a two, I'd have a two sector approach because of my, because of my background in athletics. And we all know there's the uh, master's age athlete who are very competitive. So one, one pro, one of my sales pitches would be train like a pro and Hey, are you a highly competitive master's age athlete who want to be trained like a professional team sport athlete? Here's the program for you led by, and then obviously my credentials helped carry that away. And then my other one is similar to yours with the, like I said, that general pop pre-activity prep type program. Hey, are you tired of waking up stiff and miserable with life? Here's a 35 minute program that can help make your days energized and, and viable. And wanting you to come back. Because as you know, in this day and age, and my wife's a, the king about training with that. That's why she actually, when she told me she actually liked Orange Theory, I was shocked. Because she's an in and out. She doesn't want to be, you know, the, the old cardio for an hour before my, my training session starts. And I think if you can offer somebody, you know, a 30 to 35 or max it out at 45 minute program where it's constantly moving but has different levels of, or different factions, I think you can win because nobody wants to spend their day, but people understand uh, health. And that's one thing like, I I think you'll remember Joe, because you've been around a long time and I don't want to, uh, I hope I don't miss this up because I remember this story and I don't know if it was from Dave, Kate or, how Alwyn and his wife, Rachel Cosgrove, developed their plan of like semi-group training. And again, the story I heard, and obviously I've never met those uh, couple, I highly respect what they've accomplished. But the story I heard, and see if you've heard the same thing, was they started up like in a single storefront. And they do this semi-group training, and they used video cam like TVs, and they have different pods of the program. And then as they kept getting bigger, they kept like picking off the 
the the shops in this strip mall and they blow out the door and it was like okay you come into pod one and you register and then you go in the back and you have the warm-up tape and then you move into the next bay and it's the conditioning bay and then you go into the next one and that's the strength training workout and then you go into the last one into recovery and then you get a shake and you walk out the door something to that matter and there's a lot of merit to those types of and it were, and I mean, they're still one of the most uh, highly sought after group training couples and businesses in the, in the United States, at least from what I know. Yeah, I completely agree. And my, the one point I was going to mention with your programming is that good programming and good business models, again, aren't mutually exclusive. I love the Block Zero. CrossFit has an on-ramp. Different companies have this intro program that lets people feel comfortable with starting with you because the same reason why these youth athletes want to jump ahead are similar to the reasons why adults want to stay back. They want to feel comfortable first and not be thrown into a group setting. So they still have the same want to be with friends or don't want to be with friends. And and the way you can design your programming can make you very marketable and successful as a business. So Joe, I want to thank you so much for your time today. You're going to probably expect a postcard from me via Pony Express to do another one in a couple months. But I want to tell people where they can learn more about you now, which is bighousepower.com. Joe has some excellent programming from the famous tier system that I used maybe a decade ago for a while. Really enjoyable stuff. Uh, Big House Power on Twitter, Big House Power on Instagram as well. Anything else to mention, Joe? Well, again, Joe, man, been a long time, man. I'm uh, excited that you reached out. See, that's what happens when you talk junk on Facebook about another, about another one of your uh, uh, guests, uh, Andy McCoy, who I hold in high regard. And I'm, I'm glad that it worked out. And again, like I said, I, I appreciate you asking me to come on. And, and as we know, scheduling's tight. And, I was, and I've been putting too many people off. That's why I said, as sooner you can get me on, Let's knock it out before, you know, it's two months down the road and we haven't done it. So, again, appreciate everybody who's listening. And, and to all of you who own or, or your goals are to own, I wish you everything as much success as can, can be given. Absolutely. And Joe, hang tight for just a second. I'm going to stop the recording after reminding people to make sure they follow this podcast. We put out eight episodes in the last nine days. We have tons more on deck. And we have our free video series for gym owners at levelupyourgym.com to help you out even faster.